At last, the days are longer and the hours are warmer. After a cold and unsettled start to the year, spring is finally here. And it couldn't be more welcome in the season that signals life and birth. A time to embrace new beginnings. The perfect time to put a spring in your step. Time to forget winter's cold and the rain and enjoy the spring countryside in all its glory. All week, we're travelling the length and breadth of the UK. Oh. You know, we talk about the summer of love, but this is the spring of love, isn't it? Oh. Bringing the very best seasonal stories that matter to you. How do they kill? It turns into liquid soup. Oh, it's like a cartoon villain. Welcome to Country File Spring Diaries. <laughs> And here's what's coming up for you today. Margarita's on the trail of some incredible edibles which could end up on our plates. Oh, wow! <laughs> OK, that is bright. I wasn't expecting that. In a UK first, Keeley's discovering how dogs can make a world of difference to people with dementia. How does he make you feel? I'm a, a lucky one. You hear that, Billy? You make him feel like a lucky man. And I'll be finding out how you can protect your homes from these little monsters, moth larvae. We're spending all week here on the Malvern Hills, nine miles of rugged peaks perched on top of rocks that date back almost 700 million years, some of the oldest in the UK. They're famously reputed to be the inspiration for Tolkien's novels The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings and the Narnia books by C.S. Lewis. And you only have to look at these breathtaking views across Herefordshire and Worcestershire to understand why. Not surprisingly, these hills are a paradise for dog walkers. But as we're increasingly discovering, man's best friend is so much more to us than just a companion. <laughs> It's a sad fact that every three minutes in the UK, someone develops dementia, a life-changing brain condition that's predicted to double in the next 30 years. Keeley's in Scotland finding out about a British first, a groundbreaking initiative. Could dogs be poised to help work miracles? Our canine chums are a lifeline to so many of us. More than 7,000 disabled people rely on them to lead independent lives. And some can even sniff out cancers. But today I'm in Dundee to meet one truly remarkable pioneer. This is Billy. He's the UK's first ever dementia dog trained to work in the community. Billy is helping George, who was diagnosed with dementia six months ago. And it's set to be a partnership made in heaven. A clever boy, Billy. It's a clever boy. What makes this guy even more special is that his instructors are prisoners here at HMP Castle Huntley in a scheme which is transforming lives on both sides of the prison walls. It all began just over a year ago with an Ambassador's basic dog training programme for prisoners developed by Paws for Progress. Leader of the pack, is Rebecca Leonardi. This is a great idea. Thank you, yeah, we're really excited about this project. Really great opportunity to bring together people and animals and find ways of really bringing the great benefits to everybody involved. So why prisoners? So it's developing really valuable life skills. We're thinking about things like developing patience, nurturing and caring skills. And actually, when you're learning about positive reinforcement training, those are skills that can be applied across many different areas of life as well. And for the men here, there's many who've spoken about how fabulous it is to feel like they're doing something which is really making a difference and a way of really being able to rebuild their lives as well, ready for their reintegration back into the community. The dogs must get a lot out of it too. They <laughs> certainly do, and especially like the dogs you're seeing here today, who are young dogs who are full of energy and love to learn new things and love to be kept active. And they're just lovely to spend time with, aren't they? They are, they are. You generally find that when the dogs are in the room, everybody's smiling and it's just fantastic. Yeah. 
So far, 14 prisoners have completed basic training. And there's no doubting the benefits for both dogs and prisoners. We've been asked to disguise this man's identity. You can see just from the way you, you're working with the dogs today how much you're getting out of it. Yeah, you know what a satisfaction knowing that obviously the far end of the scale is going to the community is helping people with dementia. Okay. And do you think something like this kind of helps rehabilitate and, and, and then move back into the community? Yeah, a million percent. I think for some people, that they might never have had that connection or that bond with, with anyone, but either an animal or a person. So we can give you that and a love on a, on a free basis, it's great. With basic training completed, 11 prisoners have gone up a gear and are starting to help train special dogs for people with dementia. So what's she doing? So this is learning um, how to do a headrest, which is basically just placing her head into somebody's lap. And this is something that can be really comforting and reassuring for people. And these are skills that the dementia dogs will use when they go out in the community? Absolutely, and really build on the connection between them. You must get through an awful lot of treats here. <laughs> <laughs> Carla Mouncy from the Dementia Dog Project is here to check on progress. And today it's two-year-old Billy, the UK's first dementia community dog, who's in the limelight. We're teaching Billy to check in with both people. So he's, so he's to look at both yeah. of us rather than just respond to one handler. And you find the step. Good boy. And here we teach him to find the first step in a run of stairs and wait there to let the person orientate themselves before moving on up. Well done, Billy. Good boy. Good boy. <laughs> but if training the dogs helps inmates, people living with dementia outside the prison walls are set to benefit even more. Billy's come to spend the afternoon with George. I've come to see how they're getting on. That's the same thing. Here we go, Billy, kiss. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Hello there. Hi, Hi George. Hi. Nice to you? meet you. Hi, Jules. Hi. It was a pleasure. It's for my dog, Billy. Bill, is this Billy? That's Billy. And you clean his teeth? Clean his teeth, yeah, definitely. Yeah. He looks like he's enjoying that. I hear uh, Billy's been giving you a bit of a hand with things. Oh, it's very much so. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. The confidence he restores. And it feels really good. He's a good boy, is he? He's a very good boy. Very, very easy to handle. Goes through a lot of toothpaste. <laughs> How does he make you feel? I'm a, I'm a lucky man. I'm a lucky man. OK, Billy. You hear that, Billy? You make him feel like a lucky man? Mm -hmm. So Billy obviously helps a, a lot of people. What, what yeah. kind of ways would, would, he, would he help somebody? Billy's been trained to do anything from help people off with their clothes or their gloves. He can open and close doors for people. This pouch that we have here is full of his grooming equipment and he can go and fetch that for somebody. And how would that help somebody? Some people find keeping their daily routine and their self-care a little bit tricky. We could then use mirroring techniques where the person would relate that to themselves and help them get back into a good routine that way. And it helps boost confidence, we heard, we heard Josh. Oh, yeah, definitely. They have less anxiety. By just having Billy in the room, he doesn't even necessarily need to do much. I let anybody get past. I always want them to say hello, Billy. Yeah, it gives you a bit of confidence to, to talk Very with people. So. I don't myself. think you'd need confidence to talk with people. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe that. <laughs> this is Billy's third visit to see George, who will be one of Billy's clients in this pioneering project. They will now get together once a week with a support worker, and it's making all the difference in the world to George and his daughter Claire. He'd had such a, a great character. It must be nice to see him positive and out and about like this. Yeah, it's great, it's good. It's something he likes to do. He likes being out and about. He loves outdoors and getting the fresh air and stuff. And sometimes he goes through times where he, he can't be bothered. So having Billy being there and taking him for a walk, which he enjoys, is a great thing. As a carer, do you think a scheme like this will be really valuable? Very valuable. I think it's really good because I'm also working as well as health and care for my dad. So knowing that somebody's going to get my dad out and about, doing the things he wants to do, achieving those goals, getting him less isolated back in the community, it's a great thing. I need no convincing when it comes to dogs. It never ceases to amaze me how much they enrich and enhance our lives. And if we needed any evidence of that, well, it's Billy and George. Good boy, Billy. What a truly inspirational story. And let's hope that George and Billy enjoy many more years of good companionship.
Just over the Malvern Hills lies the Vale of Evesham. It's known as England's fruit and veg basket because its fertile soil is home to some of our finest market gardens. But nowadays, when we each spend around £100 a month on takeaways and endless warnings about sugar and salt and processed food are linked to everything from cancer to obesity, what we eat has never been more important. Our food industry is under tremendous pressure to come up with solutions, and the answer could lie in the hands of scientists. Margaritas in Norwich, finding out what new fruit and veg could soon be making its way from lab to dinner plate. Norwich Market is one of the largest and oldest open-air markets in the country. But today I'm visiting another venerable institution in the city. I'm here at the John Innes Research Centre, where for more than 50 years, experts have been unlocking the secrets of the food world, and new developments could transform the way we eat. Professor Kathy Martin is at the helm of the latest research into the food of the future. Top of her list of weird and wonderful produce, purple tomatoes. So what's so special about them? You're probably much more used to seeing tomatoes like this, but we were interested in trying to see whether some of the compounds that are present in berries, so like blueberries and blackberries, which are thought to be healthy, could also be made in tomato because it's the most common food that's eaten worldwide. You have it in a lot of basic foods like pizzas and in ketchup as well. So the idea of using tomato was that one could get the health benefits of the exotic super fruits into something that lots of people eat. So how are these tomatoes different from the red tomato which we all know from our salad? So this one here is just rich in anthocyanin pigments. You can see it's, we call this the purple tomato. And this one is enriched in a compound called resveratrol, which you can get from red wine or peanuts. But in one of these tomatoes, you can get as much red, uh, resveratrol, which is thought to be very healthy, uh, as in 50 bottles of red wine. Crikey! <laughs> <laughs> Impressive sounding compounds packed into an outlandish looking fruit. It's a heady mixture, but do they actually do any good? The results that we have from cancer-prone mice, they live 30% longer if the diet is supplemented with these purple tomatoes compared to supplementation with red tomatoes. And more recently, we've done some experiments, again with mice, with this tomato, which is tiny, but it's the only one I've got, which we call bronze. And this seems to have very strong effects on suppressing inflammation in inflammatory bowel conditions. So is this food as medicine? Absolutely, it's protecting the healthy from getting chronic diseases. And also, I, I believe strongly that it can also um, uh, complement traditional therapies. So regular pharmacies can be improved at all levels by having a healthier diet, by including a lot of these compounds uh, in foods in your diet. So can I try one? What do they taste like? No. <laughs> because it's a genetically modified product and we don't have approval to eat it. Is that a little bit concerning? It might worry some people that a tomato that I can pick here and now, I couldn't actually eat. At the moment, we are going through that approval in the USA because we have to prove that they're safe. So food safety rules mean that these space-age tomatoes are off the menu in the UK for the foreseeable future. Oh, wow. OK, that is bright. I wasn't expecting that. My goodness. Don't you think it looks nice? Now I'm really wanting to try it. Put it down. <laughs> the chemical that makes Kathy's futuristic tomatoes purple is found naturally in veg like red cabbage, aubergine and a recently revived heritage potato from Cornwall. So Mother Nature provides us with anthocyanin anyway. What's the difference between the GM version and the one we could grow at home? There's more in the tomatoes and more people eat the tomatoes than would eat the purple potatoes. Kathy's also working to harness the health-boosting potential of that all-important purple compound to create the citrus fruits of the future. 
blood oranges are like the tomatoes, so they're rich in anthocyanin, so that blood colour is actually anthocyanin pigment. And what are the health properties? So it's been found with mice who are on a high-fat diet. If they're drinking blood orange juice, then they don't have the same weight gain. Whereas if they are drinking regular orange juice, without the anthocyanin pigment, they gain the grams. <laughs> so if we can do this naturally, why do a GM version? What are the benefits? One of the problems with blood oranges in terms of production is they're quite seasonal. So you could only get it from January through to March. So what we're trying to do by GM is to induce the production of anthocyanins in a Valencian type of orange so that it's without too many seeds and it's quite easy to peel and we can get the anthocyanin produced. For some people, research like this amounts to nothing less than tinkering with nature. But its supporters would argue that the problem of feeding the world's burgeoning population demands imaginative solutions. I think a lot of people have heard about food security, getting enough food to people all over the world with an increasing population and with climate change that's going to reduce yields generally. But we can't just think about getting enough calories for everyone to eat, but it has to be enough vitamins and minerals and all of the good compounds that come in plants as well that protect our health. People are eating much less fruit and vegetables than they used to do, and mirroring that is an increase in chronic diseases, it's obesity, cardiovascular diseases, and certain cancers as well. Modern genetic modification is controversial, with four in ten Brits skeptical about the benefits of so called Frankenstein food. So I'm taking to the streets of Norwich to see if purple tomatoes can sway public opinion. Would that be appealing to you? Absolutely. I think it looks great. Yeah, interesting. Would you be willing to give it a try? Well, of course I will. <laughs> yeah, I think I'd be OK to buy that. I think I'm just conditioned to expect tomato to be red. <laughs> when I see this, I'm thinking this might end up in the bin. I wouldn't... I wouldn't... <laughs> Not very appealing, are they? <laughs> so if it tasted great and there were health benefits, might you be open to trying that? Possibly, yeah. Yeah, I, I would go for the health option. And if I told you this one was genetically modified? Uh, that would be a definite no, 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 definitely no. Yeah, I take that into consideration, but I think on balance it doesn't bother me. I'm not that keen on that idea, actually. I'm not that sure that's a good plan. You don't know what you're going to get. So just to be on the safe side, because I don't know, I won't touch them. Yeah, I think I would. Yeah, especially if I had um, an illness that it would benefit me to have genetically modified. I don't know, would you? So out on the streets of Norwich, a mixed bag of responses to our purple tomatoes. But with the world's population set to increase by a predicted 35% in the next 25 years, there's no doubt that food, its production and nutritional value will continue to be a major issue for us. So are these incredible edibles a major step towards the future or a step too far? For anyone taking a stroll here on the Malvern Hills, it's obvious that nature's busy doing its own wonderful thing at this time of year. And here are our top five signs of spring. There's little to beat the sight of carpets of bluebells in our woodlands all over the UK. One of our greatest spectacles, they're at their best from April onwards, just before the trees come into full leaf and cast their shade. They're protected, so leave them where they are and enjoy them in all their spring glory. Likewise, orchards are blossoming all over the country. And bees are buzzing from flower to flower, collecting nectar. Sadly, these busy little insects are in danger, and yet they're so crucial to helping our fruit trees grow, breed, and produce the food for our tables. Spring, of course, is all about bird song, and our feathered alarm clocks are in full throttle as they defend territories and attract a mate. Try and catch a dawn chorus in woodlands where these crooners are at their finest. Robins and blackbirds are amongst the first to trill. So perhaps there really is something in the old saying that the early bird catches the worm. 
In wooded lakes and ponds, especially in South, Central and Eastern England, look out for mandarin ducks, reckoned to be the most beautiful ducks in the world. The female makes her nest in hollows of trees, and when her ducklings hatch, they have to do a bare grills to leave the nest. At just 24 hours old, they parachute to the ground, pick themselves up, and then trek up to a mile to the nearest pond. And finally, in the Cairngorms in the Scottish Highlands or in parts of England, if you go very quietly, you might just be lucky enough to see a roe deer fawn. These delicate little creatures, born in late spring, are perfectly camouflaged as they nestle deep in long grass. Their mums have to leave them somewhere safe and sound in order to feed. And on their return, they tread carefully so they don't reveal their fawn's hiding place to predators like eagles and foxes. But this mite's biggest enemy is the weather. A sudden drop in temperature could be fatal. Fingers crossed, spring is kind to them. Spring is traditionally the time when we used to give our homes a good old deep clean. But nowadays that spruce up isn't necessarily uh, what it used to be. And so unwittingly, we could be inviting some home wreckers into our houses. Moths. Alarmingly, the numbers of these creatures have doubled in the past two years. So if you, like me, want to take care of your jumpers, you want to know what you can do about them. Paul is on the case. Moths are on the rampage. They're chewing through our carpets, our clothes, and even our soft furnishings. Available research only covers England, but it reveals that 42 of 48 counties have been invaded by the mini munchers. And now my family and I have become part of that grim statistic. A couple of weeks ago, I was moving a lot of baskets which were full of kids' toys from underneath this low dresser. And I discovered bald patches in this carpet. This is a pure wool carpet, which has been down about nine years. But it's been eaten, it's been really been chewed away by moths. And it really did freak me out. So I've ripped most of the carpet out and I've replaced it with this brand new floor. So I've just got this bit to get rid of and then we will be carpet free and hopefully moth free. But goodness knows how long that has been going on for underneath our noses. As house guests go, they've got to be one of the worst. They multiply like crazy with one moth laying 100 eggs in just a few days. And it's those larvae that make a meal of fine fabrics, causing hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of damage every year. But it's not just family homes that are under attack. Nothing escapes the monster moths. Some of our grandest houses have problems. And yes, in all likelihood, even you know who. They're a real problem as old as time itself. And Dee Lauder from English Heritage has popped round to show me how they're busy tucking into our national treasures. Hi, Dee. Hello, nice to meet you. Basically, I've brought some photographs to show you of clothes moth damage. And these were all items from Brodsworth Hall in South Yorkshire near Doncaster. It's a Victorian mansion we took on. And we found lots of evidence of very old moth damage from clothes, to carpets. Look at that, they've even attacked the taxidermy. Yep, yeah, because they're basically, the source that they're looking for to feed on the larva is protein. Yeah. And all of these are protein based. So you had a real problem in this house. Have you noticed an increase in moths? Well, from 2009, the amount that we found doubled. OK, yeah. The numbers are still absolutely whomping up year after year after year, mm. because we're now finding that after dust, it's the insect pests that are the next biggest cause for concern that can be a threat to vulnerable collections that we, that we look after. Yeah, they may be small, but they're predators. Indeed. With the help of the visitors to its properties, English Heritage has carried out research into our moth invasion. It revealed that London and the South East are the country's major hotspots, closely followed by the South West which means my home in Wiltshire is in the eye of a moth storm. Great. 
If you think I've got problems, imagine what it must be like in a place like this. Laycock Abbey has over 25 rooms, and they've been fighting the good fight since moths arrived last year. Just down the road from me in Wiltshire, the Abbey started life as a 13th century nunnery. But since the microscopic marauders took up residence, the National Trust's conservation assistant, Kim Gribble, has been battling to keep the Abbey's history intact. So tell me more about it. How did you first notice? We were doing our regular quarterly check to see what pests we got in the room, and we discovered we'd gone from one or two on the trap, which is nothing to worry about, to having 107. That's incredible, isn't it? This is one of the traps that we would have found. Um, this one doesn't have 107 on it. No, but there's <laughs> um, enough in a small there's, area. There's enough to be worried at the numbers on here, but then we went hunting to find out where the um, infestation was, and when we pulled back the top sheet on the bed, we discovered devastation. Um, oh. They were in the pillows, on the eider down, oh. everywhere. Well, they've certainly had a good go at this, haven't they? Yeah, the reason they've gone for the eider down is because it's got um, feathers inside it. Yeah. Um, and it's also silk. Well, that's like a yeah. gourmet meal, is it? It really is, yeah. They like sort of wool products, animal furs, feathers, and then silks, and then from then on, cons and things as well. Okay. They, so they do work their way down. Yeah. Yeah. They end up with the cheap stuff. Yeah, well, <laughs> any natural fibre is, is, is game, basically. Really? Yeah. This is terrible, isn't it? Yeah. So, what did you do to start with? Once we found the source, we then sort of go through the process of wrapping everything in plastic um, and either sending it off for freezing or freezing ourselves. OK, so this will kill the egg? And the larvae, yeah. And then while that's being done, we then completely strip the room back and completely clean it from the ceiling down to the floor. Where did they come from in the first place? If you haven't got them, and then all of a sudden you have... Just from outside. Everyone's getting them. There's a massive resurgence. They Why? Think, they think global warming is a contr contributing yeah. factor because they can have a more regular cycle. Um, because it's warmer, they can grow more frequently. Yeah. And then people are moving over to wearing more natural fibres. Yeah. When we were in the 60s and 70s and everyone's walking around in nylon um, and polyester, you're not getting huge... Tough on they the can't, moths. They can't eat them, yeah. so now we're all yeah. switching back to cottons and linens. They've got food again. My excuse is because I'm busier. <laughs> I haven't got we're time all, to we're hoover. All, we're all busier, yeah. <laughs> There's less hoovering and dusting going on. There is indeed, yes. Yeah, there's no housewives in the 1940s spending the day hoovering anymore. Embracing my inner domestic goddess is clearly the best form of prevention. But let's face it, how many of us have got time for endless housework these days? And of course, we're not helping by making the critters nice and warm in our snug, centrally heated homes. I need the help of Bugbuster Ben Sargent from Wiltshire County Council to help me get rid of my moths once and for all. Now, look at this, Ben. I found them in the dark, lurking underneath there. Okay. You can see my carpet's been eaten away. Look at that, underneath the legs of the dresser and all along the skirting board. How long has that been going on? Well, this doesn't look like this has just happened overnight. This has been going on for some time. Let's have a look and see what sort of moth it is first. Straight away, you can see all these little white cases. Yeah. This is a case-bearing carpet moth. So there's lots of them on here. Now, these guys, they love dark spaces and they love a high wool content carpet. They lay the eggs on the carpet, they hatch out into these larvae. Now, these guys then crawl around and it's them that do the damage. And what they've done is they've had a feast here, I can see yeah. that. And if we have a little look in this one, I believe... If I give a little squeeze there, you see his head pop out. Ah. Uh. <laughs> that That's actually disgusting. There. He's alive. alive. He is. Yeah. And he, the whole time, he's been slowly munching your carpet. Is this a bad case in your experience? Is this a lot? Um, yes, I can see that. They've Thanks. obviously been here for some period of time. Thanks, yeah. <laughs> what do you do apart okay. from put a, an oak floor down? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, some people, if the damage isn't perhaps as extensive as this, um, we could treat the carpet. But in this instance, what you need to do is hoovering. So we'll just give this a jolly good hoover, even though this is going out the window. Yep. We want to hoover it first, because if we just take that out and put it straight outside your window, there's nothing to stop them flying straight back inside and looking for that nice woolen jumper. OK. I can avoid the hoover no longer. So while I get busy, here are our top tips on how to beat the moth invasion in your home. Using traps will help you find where they're hiding. Then try repelling them with lavender, cedar or rosemary oil. Moths love dirty clothes, so wash woolies before they go in the wardrobe and store them in plastic if possible. Putting clothes and soft furnishings in the freezer for two weeks will kill off moths and larvae. But again, don't forget to wrap them in plastic. And last, but by no means least, hoover everywhere. And I mean everywhere. Just there on the side, just here. 
on the end of that. Yeah, look, picture. look at that. You hold that, I'm going to hoover it. <laughs> <laughs> There's no escape, is there? They do get everywhere. Right, job done. High five. Okay, let's go. Some very useful bug-busting ideas there, but, uh, of course, for me, the problem is that with all my jumpers, I'd need a really big freezer. Now, just down the road from here, visitors flock to the Malvern Spring Flower Show, looking for ideas and inspiration for their gardens. It's the time of year when we get spoiled for choice, and there's nothing lovelier than spring bulbs in our homes. Matt's been in Lincolnshire to find out how British growers have fought back against the Dutch tulip invasion. No, I grow without being subjected. This state-of-the-art machine photographs, x-rays, measures and gathers data. When I was a young... Best stick to the day job, Matt. For so many of us, the only way that we can get out into the countryside is by car. And as we all know only too well, our roads are becoming one huge traffic jam. In fact, it's reckoned that uh, each of us will spend the equivalent of 32 hours a year just not moving. We have more cars than ever, more than 30 million, and there are plans for 84 new roads and improvements all over the UK, costing 15 billion pounds. Hopefully, they'll stop everything from grinding to a standstill. Among them, a proposed six-lane extension to the M4 in South Wales, one of the most congested motorways in the country. But it will scythe through one of Britain's most important nature reserves, threatening some of our rarest wildlife. Jules is in Gwent to discover who will be the winners and the losers. Not far from the Usk Valley in South Wales lie the Gwent levels. Dating back to Roman times, they teem with wildlife and are known as Wales' answer to the Amazon. But the 14 miles addition to the M4 that's in the pipeline could, if it goes ahead, destroy the levels. It's an example of battles fought all over the country as the need for new roads clashes with our love of havens like this. But getting there is something else. Every day here on the M4 in South Wales, there are some 30 traffic jams costing the Welsh economy an estimated £165 million. Pounds. So clearly, something needs to be done. But the Gwent Level's 6,000 acres will take the brunt. I'm meeting Gwent Wildlife Trust's chief executive, Ian Rappel, to find out what the damage could be. Can you give us a sense of the impact of this new motorway extension? What it would do to this area that you take so much care over? What it will do is effectively break the landscape. It will be a barrier to wildlife, both sides of it. A barrier to the 900 miles of rains and ditches here, and the possibility that, that runoff from that road can get into these ditches. They're very, very sensitive. I mean, if you were to fall in... <laughs> you'd be... Don't tempt fate. <laughs> you'd, be, you'd be swimming in a, in, a, in a soup of invertebrate life. You know, there's over 150 notable species that are in these ditches, and that's just the rare ones. The diversity here is comparable to the rainforest. The new stretch of motorway would cut through a substantial area of the levels and cause permanent damage to five areas of special scientific interest. Amongst other creatures, it would also threaten the thriving water vole population, which has been brought back from the brink of extinction. You've also had some success with cranes as well, haven't you? Well, yeah, and honestly, it's our neighbours who've had the greatest success with it, because it was a crane reintroduction programme on the Somerset levels. And it just so happens that, that there's, there's a pair of cranes who prefer the Gwent levels, so they've been popping across. <laughs> <laughs> because nature knows no boundaries. It doesn't matter whether you're English or Welsh. They're, they're coming here, though. I can see why the issue of the road is so emotive. I think, you know, the, the levels isn't perfect in an ecological sense, but, but there's great promise there, and if we manage it well, as we've found with the water voles, you know, we can continue that great experiment where human beings and wildlife work together. Of course, controversial road building is nothing new. Britain's transport plans, the most ambitious for a generation, promise to boost local economies. In this case, the M4 extension could bring in another £40 million a year by 2037. Not to be sniffed at. Surely we can mitigate the impact on the landscape while still allowing the route to go through. 
I don't think that we can. The idea is that you could just dig a new ditch and that would replicate something that's developed over hundreds of years. That's not realistic. Not on the route they've picked. I mean, they've picked the most destructive, environmentally damaging, the most expensive, and the one that would take the longest to build. Many people living along the M4 corridor will say the road will greatly improve the quality of their life, both socially and economically. Well, I mean, the first thing to say is, yeah, yeah you know, the transport situation in this country does... Everybody's not in. You know, it does. <laughs> yeah. I mean, or it, Especially it, those know. of us that rely on it, yeah. yeah. We're, we're all commuters. The point is, I suppose, if you look at the time saving for this road, you're talking about nine or ten minutes in exchange for what? For, for a landscape that's been here for thousands of years. And once it's gone, it's gone. Ian's concerns that the road will wipe out wildlife are disputed by the Welsh Government. In a statement sent to us from the Transport Ministry, they say the new corridor will just skirt the northern edge of the levels. 110 hectares of new woodland are planned, reed beds to naturally filter water and a bridge to avoid any impact on otters and migratory fish in the River Severn. And of course, there's the economic argument. Well, the weather has definitely turned, so it's a good cue to head off from the levels up to the village of Magor, where I'm due to meet Paul Byatt from the M4 Business Network. He, of course, is in favour of the new motorway extension, but I've just heard he's going to be late, because guess what? He's stuck in traffic. It's thought that for every pound spent on Britain's roads, our economy benefits by four pounds. So, with the Welsh coffers set to swell, businessman Paul's a big supporter. You finally made it then, through the traffic? Oh, yeah, it's a bit <laughs> ironic, really, that well, uh, I got delayed about half an hour in the M4 traffic. Well, I suppose it does rather make the point, doesn't it, that there is clearly an issue with congestion on this part of the M4. But how important to you would be a relief road, economically speaking? It's holding back a lot of businesses. Recently, I came back from a trip abroad, uh, flew into Gatwick, actually managed to get around the M25 better than I got through the uh, tunnels <laughs> in Newport. So, uh, I mean, in fairness, it's not a long stretch of the M4. It's probably only eight or nine miles, I would guess. Um, but it can take an hour to get through that. It's a difficult one to square, isn't it? The environmental concerns on the one hand and the economic pressure on the other to relieve the congestion. Very much so, and my view is that, you know, we need to make the traffic situation better around Newport, and how that's done, I think we should be consulting with all of the different organisations, including the Wildlife Organisation, um, and if we can find a happy medium, then it's win-win. So if you could click your fingers, when would the new scheme come into play? Immediately. Well, the battle lines between wildlife and roads have been well and truly drawn here on the Gwent levels. Of course, it's going to be some time before we really find out who are the winners and the losers, but as it's a dilemma facing many other parts of the country, I suspect it's an issue that isn't going to go away anytime soon. It's quite a dilemma, isn't it? And a decision on the new road is due later this year. In the meantime, do be sure to join us tomorrow for Country File Spring Diaries when Paul's on canal cleanup duty. That is disgusting, isn't it? Someone's just yep. thrown their household waste into the canal. It makes you want to cry. Margarita's mucking in with an animal rescue squad. We've got a gull coming in with hooks in its beak. And I'll be showing you how our new craze for artisan bread might just land you your dream job in the country. So, goodbye until then. <laughs>